Thank you, John. Are these drugs safe? Okay, the secret killer. I think I'll put these four back. Uh, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da -da. Now, am I on? I'll see you guys. Have a good one. I'm on. Okay, good. I'm going to put all these back here. Uh, Cray, have a good one. Hello, folks. Thank you for joining me. I'm glad you're here. We have had uh, kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, record numbers of you joining us, and man, that does my heart good. Thank you so, so much. Put my phone on silent. So many things I want to go over with you here. Um, should we start with these? Let me put these back. When I left you last time, or when I went to phone calls, by the way, that's, I need to tell you, that's my priority. Your comments, questions, cheers, and jeers are really my priority. I will take those uh, over the education process. So when you guys want to ask, um, I'm ready to rock and roll at any time. Just drove back this morning. It's four, four and a half hour drive from Austin, Texas. Uh, we bought a little home there to be near the, the kids and grandkids, and it needed a lot of work. And I may be too old for that. But I'm loving it. I mean, it's, I'm having a ball. We just smile when we get up in the morning. We smile when we go to bed in the evening because every day you make little changes. And last night we ate at a place, I, I can't remember the name of it, a fairly crowded place. And we went with Berkeley. He's a little white belt. That's your first, you know, in karate. John, this took me back. Evan was probably eight or nine years old when he began karate. He got up white belt, yellow belt, and went up from there. He's a tough little guy, my son, tough big guy now. Uh, and his son is going through that too. And I'm telling you, I remember these classes. These karate teachers are gold. These are five-year-old kids. He says, now I want you to sit on this line, and they all start, you know, they're so hyper, they're bouncing around. No, no, come on, sit on this line. You know, and they all do this. It's just tremendous watching it last night. Then we went out to eat and uh, slept a little bit, got up this morning, met some people working around the house, and here I am. I wanted to go over, we started on cancer, didn't we? We talked about breast cancer last week, and a couple of you said, hey, I wanted more. Uh, so we got this, what causes breast cancer? We were talking about alcohol, uh, carbs, starches, antibiotics. What do they all have in common? Mycotoxins, fungal mycotoxins. So we got that far. <clears throat> I told you about this, new study on cancer, it's our DNA fault. It's your DNA. It's nothing but your DNA. Two thirds of cancers are unavoidable, says Telegraph News, March 2017. Uh, you know, you just live your life. Scientists in the US, of course, found cancers are caused by random mistakes in your genetic code. <laughs> it's your DNA. So if you could reach inside and spank one of those guys, it's your DNA. It was mom and dad, it's grandpa, probably grandpa, you know those men. Uh, it, it's not your fault. And then uh, 10 years earlier, we talked about, wait a minute, antibiotics, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, alcohol, breast, pro uh, breast lung, prostate, you know, cancer. I, folks, it's not. The genius will figure out the etiology of cancer, and it's not your DNA. This is analogous to the ad I saw on TV a couple of years ago with this, you know, guy with a stethoscope around his neck looking really cool, great haircut. And uh, we doctors believe that uric acid causes gout. So we have a new medicaid. What? The genius is going to figure out what causes uric acid. I'm telling you folks, we think we're the brightest country. I think we are too. We think our developments are far advanced over everyone. So let's inhibit a reuptake. Uh, event that takes place in our brain and cope with depression. Why not know the cause? Well, we'll never figure that out. We're only 180 IQs. And the teachers at medical school told us we're not smart enough to figure out why problems happen. We just arrest them with a prescription pad. Makes sense, doesn't it, financially? Never ending cycle. So when I see something like this, it says it's your DNA's fault. What negatively impacts the DNA? The brilliant researcher will figure that out. So there's drugs coming on the market to stop your DNA. You cannot believe, I'll go over this with you in one of the next few weeks, you can't believe the products coming down the pipe right now. 
that hurt us instead of trying to fix a problem by knowing its etiology. What's the etiology of, of gout? Brewer's yeast. How do I know that? Two ways. In the 1950s, when my dad had it, in the 1960s, what was gout called? The beer drinker's disease. Dad could suck down beer like I can't believe till the day he died, drinking, drinking, drinking beer. He's a World War II guy. That's what World War II guys did, a lot of them. Um, and uh, then the second thing is, we now know that Brewer's yeast makes uric acid. This has been proven 40, 50 years ago. It's in my uh, The Fungus Link to Diabetes book. The reference is in there. I mean, it's fascinating, folks. So you mean we don't have to inhibit uric acid from causing the crystalline you know, compound in your joints, elbows, shoulders, the ow in your toe, gout, it really hurts. You gotta quit drinking beer. Why? Well, we don't know. Yeah, we do. Brewer's yeast makes uric acid. Okay, so when I see something like this, it's your DNA's fault. What messes up our DNA? I went over this with you, okay. Okay, I went over all this. Can antibiotics cause cancer? I've listed the five types of cancer. No. Are we calling it cancer when it's fungus? Pulmonary coccidioideomycosis is suggestive of metastatic malignancy. Wait a minute, that's a fungus in the lung. Localized bu uh, cutaneous blastomycosis is frequently mistaken for squamous cell carcinoma. So mom and dad and everybody who's been out in the sun has squamous cell carcinoma. What's its etiology? What caused not Well, the sun, that darn sun. God's mistake. Man, can't believe why he'd put a ball of fire up there to burn our skin and give us squamous cell carcinoma. Really? Because this fungus in 1957, this is out of an old Johns Hopkins medical book, this fungus in 1957 was found to coexist with squamous cell carcinoma. You mean that could be a fungus? Yeah, yeah. Why don't 10-year-olds have squamous cell carcinoma? It's as we age, our white blood cell population begins to go down. We are living on the edge, so to speak, because it's not the alcohol we drink today, it's that which we drank, and I told you, my 20s are a blur. Uh, it's that which we drank back in our 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and so catches up with you. It's not the antibiotic that causes breast cancer. It's taking these drugs over and over and we haven't even opened the window to all the other drugs. Wait till we open it on statin drugs. Okay? <clears throat> this guy Curtis Chong, I followed him for a year or so. Curtis is an impressive guy. Uh, he's an MD and then he's a PhD, so he's doctor, doctor. He is categorizing repurposed drugs. Repurposed drug isn't new. It's the reason that the acne drug retinoic acid is now a treatment for acute form of leukemia. Thank you. Facebook wants to talk. Aren't, uh, do you find these questions just... Pardon? Uh, we have such a bright audience. I know. I mean, it's, I'm so proud of you guys. Just hear me out on this. Curtis Chong, retinoic acid. It's why repurposing drugs, finding an existing drug that worked for hiccups or migraines, or God forbid, you know, something that worked for cancer, it's already here. Now it's in a one dollar drug when they find it, and then when it, it successfully treats a medical problem, it becomes a fifty dollar drug. Uh, it's why kinaconazole works for fungal infections, is also used for prostate cancer treatment. Curtis knew this. That was a 19, um, 1993 publication. Guys, prostate disease, a drug called ketoconazole. It's also called nizorol. It's a, it's a fungal, an antifungal drug. So this whole thing of cancer being linked to fungus isn't new. It goes back a long time. Now I want to read you about retinoic acid and ketoconazole. Retinoic acid, excellent, ex excellent candidate for a new combined antifungal strategy for systemic mycoses and immunocompromised in cancer patients, said in 2016, Drug Design Development and Therapy. Retinoic acid, really, is an excellent candidate 
for new, com uh, for new combined antifungal strategies for systemic mycosis, bloodstream candida, bloodstream aspergillus, bloodstream alternaria in immunocompromised and cancer patients. That was four years ago. Where is retinoic acid being used for cancer now? And then 1997, here it is. The antifungal drug Nizorol or ketoconazole was first proven to help prostate cancer patients. And then finally this, Karen, hang on. If fungus mimics or this is a graphic I put up on the, on the screen as I'm lecturing to doctors. If fungus mimics or causes cancer, wouldn't logic dictate that antifungal drugs that have already been developed would help cancer patients? Mm. You know what I'm gonna do? This is pretty thick. I'm gonna hold on to this till Thursday. Several cases, and there are many more, several cases where antifungal drugs that were developed for our simple fungal problems um, go on to induce apoptosis, or cause cancer cell death, or inhibit angiogenesis, inhibit cancer from metastasizing. Okay, so I, and John, if you would remind me, I wanna start with the drugs that are being discovered to help cancer patients now and how, how they all happen to be antifungal drugs. I was gonna go over this with you and so I'll wait till next week on that. I do wanna touch bases here. So many of you are watching from other countries now. Uh, uh, thank you. It, it's such a blessing to have you here. Three doctors with World Health Organization 20, 25 years ago said these diseases, they thought, are intimately linked to fungus. Well, any, your doctor wouldn't know this. They're saying AIDS. They're saying uh, cirrhosis of the liver. They're saying skin psoriasis. They're saying arthritis. Is like, your doctor doesn't know this. Although mycotic arthritis, the fungal arthritis, is very well published. It's the last thing teachers in medical schools want your doctor to know. Every time you use the I word, it means the A word. Every time an infection exists, an antibiotic, da 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 And I'd love to tell you they're working. Sometimes antibiotics can be life-saving. Some of you, I had a call from a friend of mine who's watching right now who said, Doug, should I take this antibiotic? The whole time she's talking to me, <coughs> yes, take the antibiotic. Chase afterwards, if the doctor will let you, with a good month of a good probiotic. Get rid of that crud. It could be life-saving, folks. This is why antibiotics, this is why in 1928, penicillium was found to make a poison called penicillin. And that penicillin was to be used judiciously for known bacterial infections. Poof, gone. Any infection gets an antibiotic today. You know what? I wish I had my doctor hat. Uh, John, remind me sometime to get a doctor hat and a layman's hat. Uh, folks, when, when, when that woman I spoke with the other day, if I'm a doctor, okay, God forbid, if I'm a doctor and you come to me and you're hacking and coughing, I've got to rule out a virus, but now the virus has impeded your immune system enough uh, that you now are growing opportunistic bacteria and probably fungus. Bacterial tests are very quickly. I mean, you, you can test for bacteria and virus now. They put that long string in your nose, goes back to the back of your throat, boom, automatically. Wow, okay, this is a virus, uh, or this is a bacteria, or this is a concomitant. This is both. And here's what I'm going to do to treat you. The problem is, I've been an opponent of rushing to antibiotics for 50 years, but in reality, folks, until recently, we haven't had a fungal test. You gotta take that stuff from the bronchi, you know, from the lungs, do a bronch, uh, uh, do a bronch on a patient, right? A bronchoscopy, and pull that stuff out, put it in a Petri dish and send it to a lab that has technicians that know what a fungus is. And they then have to grow it out for a couple of weeks. This fungus is slow to grow. It didn't start like that in your respiratory system. It took maybe months or years to begin growing. So um, in their defense, in your doctor's defense, what he's trying to do is erase something leading to you being, a fib or being febrile, being feverish, leading to you watching your white count go through the roof. Uh, that's what the body does when you have an infection. It doesn't matter. 
whether it's a fungal or bacterial infection, your white count's gonna go up and it's gonna give you a fever. Your body's trying to burn the organism off, inducing the fever, inducing the high white count, inducing the sore throat and the itching ears and so forth. So if I'm a doctor, and here is where I would have my glass ball on my head, if I were a doctor, I'd say, okay, Linda, I'm gonna give you an antibiotic, but I'm also gonna do a quick test on you, PCR test, we've talked about this, brand new test. And this PCR test will, a day or two, will have your answer on fungus. So go ahead and get started with the antibiotic. If my nurse or I call you uh, and tell you, okay, this is fungal, I'm gonna switch you, then do that. I think doctors are doing that now. And thank God I'm still alive at this age after almost 50 years, 49 years of preaching this. Because I hope five years from now it's just routine. That's what we're trying to make happen. As you know, I work with a lot of really good doctors. If, I, if these three were still alive, one of them isn't, and I don't know if the other two are, I never knew them. Here's the diseases they said were intimately linked to fungus. Now here's a book that's 500 pages. It's called Prostate Cancer, Hope at Last. Atherosclerosis, plaque in the arteries. Breast cancer, colon, liver, uterine, ovarian, prostate cancer. AIDS, gout, Crohn's, multiple sclerosis, hyperactivity, infertility, cirrhosis and psoriasis, Alzheimer's disease, I'm telling you, scleroderma, Renau's disease, sarcoidosis, kidney stones, amyloidosis, vasculitis, Cushing's disease, arthritis, and the list goes on and on and on. So the question would be, where does this stuff grow? And that's where principles and practice of clinical mycology, all these doctors say. <laughs> I'm getting it loud and clear, John. Okay, thank you. Fungal infections of the respiratory tract, fungal infections of the eye, fungal infections of the kidney, and those associated with wrecking your kidney. Does your nephrologist know about fungus? Many don't. Fungal disease of the genitourinary system, and look at what's under here. Fungal prostatitis. You know the most common fungus growing in the prostate of men when they do these studies? Candida. That which grows in the vaginal tract, grows in the prostate. In my book, the new book on women's health, are we passing this back and forth? What a logical question. Fungal infections of the GI tract, gastrointestinal, fungemia in the bloodstream. Fungal infections of ear, nose, and throat, fungus of the skin, fungus causing mass lesions, sores that don't heal in the central nervous system. Fungal meningitis, fungal uh, in the heart, fungus in the heart, fungus in the bone and joint. So the bottom line to this is, guys, it's a huge problem. How I wish our doctors were being educated with books like that. Um, how I wish. I hope in the next five years, medical schools, well, medical schools are developing new antifungal drugs. I'm sorry, medical schools. Pharmaceuticals companies are developing new antifungal drugs, so they'll have their... PhD teachers begin teaching about fungus in, uh, in medical school training. When a young person's 23, 24 years old, really smart, going through medical training, you see currently there are hundreds of antibiotics. That's what they gotta get off the shelves. So every student in that 80 student, you know, the, the first year medical school, you're gonna learn about statins and antibiotics and high blood pressure medicine and antidepressants and selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and heart defib, you know. You're gonna learn about what's for sale in a pharmacy. How I wish that one of those 80s would just say, are we gonna to get to the cause of gout? Oh, well, uric acid's the cause. No, it's what makes uric acid. It doesn't happen, folks. You've got them just in love with these professors. That's a healthy relationship. Okay, now. Okay, Facebook and YouTube. Okay, so Karen asked, good question. Are allergic reactions a sign of fungal exposure? In the old days, I, I think I told you, Karen, uh, so 1972, I went to work for a guy. Wow, was that 48 years ago? I'm back from Vietnam. I opened the newspaper and there's a job available. And this doctor, here's how God's worked in my life. This doctor, his name's Howard Gottschalk. He's out in Los Angeles. Um, he's looking for a nurse. We were kind of trained as nurses. He 
was looking for a nurse with a background in understanding anaphylaxis. Anaphylactic reactions are type 1 allergic reactions, a cause and effect relationship. I get into peanuts, my tongue swells, and in 30 seconds I'm dead. Unfortunately, we see that in the newspapers from time to time. A bee sting, death. That's an anaphylactic, dangerous type reaction. You've read about the EpiPens, epinephrine, you just put right through your clothes, boom, boom, wherever, you know, boom. Um, can be life-saving, right? So I worked with Howard Gottschalk, and we would do something called a nasal cytogram. So he would, in the exam room, he'd take a little bit of uh, the thick stuff that grows up in the patient's nose, put it on a glass slide, hand it to me, and I'd air dry it, and then uh, I would put a, a little drop of oil immersion on it, uh, stain it with, uh, I think it was uh, Giesma stain or Tripan blue or maybe both, and then you put a cover glass on it and you look at it in the microscope. Now, if there's a lot of PMNs, polymorphonucleated leukocytes, a lot of type of white blood cells, you probably got an infection, huge number of white blood cells going to beat up whatever that is in the stain. Sometimes you would see bacteria. As opposed to a differential diagnosis that uh, I learned about, and that was another type of white blood cell called an eosinophil. An eosinophil is an allergic when you see allergy, you see lots of these eosinophils. But I gotta tell you folks, the more I study fungus, the more I see eosinophil counts in our bloodstream elevating significantly. So Karen, in answer to your question, 50 years ago, I thought that if you were allergic to fungus, your nasal smear would have a lot of you know, eosinophils in it. I assume that because when I tested these patients, Alternaria, Hormodendrum, Cephalosporium, Penicillium, when you test them on their arm, the fungi would always increase. Took me about six months to realize every time I saw eosinophil count high, telling Dr. Godshock these are allergic patients, not infected patients. High number of other white blood cells, polymorphonucleated leukocytes, you've got an infection. Hey doctor, this seems to be an allergic response. Then I'd test the patient's back or arm, and I'd find huge number of molds reacting. So our eosinophils, even today, in allergy clinics, they don't understand this. Doug's hypotheses, I believe anytime you see eosinophils, and there's eosinophilic myalgia syndrome, there's all sorts of eosinophilic diseases now. Anytime you see a lot of eosinophils, think fungus, okay? Our allergic reaction is a sign of fungal exposure. So many people, here's all I have to go on, Karen, I hope this helps. Years and years and years of doing clinical work with doctors in their offices taught me. When people took Diflucan, Nystatin, Spornox, Lamisil, Amphotericin B, um, you know, Griseofulvin, there was only a handful of antifungal drugs on the market and they followed my diet. Now remember, these were people with psoriasis, arthritis, deep uh, suicidal depression, huge number of people with stomach problems, etc. And the doctors I worked with said, well, it's working so well for psoriasis, why don't we put them on an antifungal, your diet, which starves fungus, and see if they get better. Long way of saying, all you've got to do, do we need Diflucan? If I had cancer, you know, if I had... Uh, atherosclerosis real badly, I, you bet I'd go on prescriptive antifungals. Today I'd look at, you know, uh, black seed oil, I'd look at resveratrol, I'd look at olive leaf, I'd look at any number of herbs and, uh, you know, lavender and clove and all these good, oregano and all these good spices, and I would be looking at those and Kaufman's diet, and really, Karen, in two weeks you're going to know. Many people say, Doug, I am miserable with this allergy. It's horrible this time of year. Uh, they call it uh, cedar fever in Austin. And you literally, when the wind blows, it turns a brown hue. There are so many cedar trees in Austin, and people are sick and miserable. Is it cedar, or am I an accident waiting to happen? Do I have a lot of fungus that somehow cedar is cleaving onto, and I'm becoming sick because of that? I don't know. But here's what I'd do. I'd get to a health food store, get a couple of antifungals, follow the Kaufman diet, and if within a week there's improvement, good. If within two weeks you're saying, wow, 
I feel horrible. Gee, I watched the news tonight and the pollen count was through the roof. We're on to something. I think many, many people have a dormant or underlying fungal condition that yields allergic type symptoms. Take it a step further. Like these doctors, I think many diseases, including arthritis, vasculitis, you know, hyperactivity, I think many of these things are due to fungus. But in medicine, all we want to do is erase them. We don't want to know their cause. Man, there's, what, trillions, no longer billions, trillions of dollars in erasing. Look at the statin drugs. All they did was kill fungus. 25 years ago, you know, they, they, they were just fungal killers. And then a study was done. I read you that study, did I not? Where they were testing, I think last week I did. See if I remember. They were testing Lamisil and Sporinox to see which most effectively killed toenail fungus. This was 20, uh, 25, 1995, I think, 25 years ago. They ran it in a medical journal. A couple doctors sent it to me. So half of my career ago. And they found that the, uh, that the uh, terben terbenafin, it's called uh, the Lamisil, uh, worked a little bit better than the Sporinox. If one was 75%, one was 78%. So 78%, the um, Lamisil worked a little bit letter, uh, better at clearing toenail fungus. But then an amazing statement was made. One sentence, I have the original paper, of interest is the fact that Sporinox lowered the cholesterol of 81% of people who took it. Off to the races. Say no more. An antifungal... You guys are smart. These questions tell me so. This audience tells me so. Where's your brain going right now? Theirs went off to the cash register. Ching, ching. Wow. Everybody knows when your cholesterol is high, you have heart disease. Didn't matter if that was true or not. We've convinced cardiologists and internal medicine specialists that a high cholesterol, like I have, is dangerous. These people aren't going to live 60 years. We've got to get them on statin drugs and save their lives. Folks, the bottom line is, do you have the question I have right now? Is that true, Doug? Did Spornox lower the cholesterol of over four in five of these subject patients? Absolutely true, 25 years ago. Off to the races they went to find other antifungals that would be profitable. Let's convince all, let's put salespeople in their office, you know how it works, and convince doctors that we're saving lives left and right. And then there's you and me. And I'm sitting here thinking, if an antifungal drug, if an antifungal drug inhibits cancer from spreading, if an antifungal drug lowers 81% of people's uh, you know, cholesterol or lipids, LDA, or, you know, the, the problem lipids, triglycerides and so forth, what must elevate them? Are you with me? Is it a simple F-U-N-G-U-S? Does six letters define why we're getting cancer? Why we're having atherosclerosis or MS or autism or gout? Does six letters define why uh, these antifungals on the market today, they're calling statin drugs, are lowering? What raises it? I could give a flip what takes it down, but I now know, gee, there are many natural things I can walk into a health food store and get. I can change my diet. And, st and folks, any of us today, thanks to Life Extension, I think they're going to be here, they're doctors, next week or something. You and I can go to any lab in our little town. Most all labs, the biggest lab in the world, works with Life Extension. You can walk in there and say, I want a cholesterol test. And then they'll send the uh, test results to, thank you, John. They'll send the uh, test results to the doctors at Life Extension. They'll call you and say, wow, your cholesterol is 325, um, and apprise you of that. Then what I would do is follow my own program and take some antifungals, and in a month, I'd go back to the lab. I want another test done. Then the doctor calls you in a few days and says, hey, I don't know what you did, but it's now 240. It's heading in the right direction. Do you see where I'm going? Would you rather take a drug? And America shakes their head, yeah. 
we're in a hurry to get our cholesterol down because our doctor told us that it was going to kill us. Um, are you worried about the gastrocnemius muscle breaking? Are you worried about the complications? We haven't seen the beginning of this with all these statin drugs, I, I contend. Or would you rather figure out the cause? Now, most people, you're not most people. Maybe every once in a while I get someone in here who is, but most people say, okay, so I've got to go off bread and pasta? I can't drink anymore? Big price to pay. Or take a statin drug. Believe me when I tell you, 80% of Americans take the statin drug. Go back to the doctor, and the doctor takes their blood and says, wow, that statin drug is really, uh, great, doc. So now you're not going to die of that. Keep drinking your bottle of wine, you know, your glass of wine. Keep eating your pasta. I'm a different kind of a guy. And that's what I try and teach here. I think 81% of those of you watching right now who are on statin drugs could challenge this easily. Easily. And in one month know the answer. There is fear sometimes in those test results. You mean I've got to exercise? I can no longer eat these foods. And folks, I worked with hundreds of people like this. Um, the answer is, yeah, you can't do that anymore to stabilize your cholesterol, if high cholesterol. You know what I think one day? I think they're going to find that elevated cholesterol is life-saving, not life-taking. Don't tell medicine about this. But I think one day, you mark my words, one day, you're going to read it in the newspaper. Wow, that high cholesterol wasn't uh, the problem at all. But we sure made $6 trillion putting people on it. First, you have to train, re-socialize the brilliant minds in medical training. You can't do a thing about it. Oh, no, you can't eat your, so keep eating your burgers and fries and so forth. But here's a pill, okay? So, allergic reactions, a sign of fungal exposure. I think in many cases, yes, and I'd challenge it. Um, so Christine says, hi, Doug. Thank you for, you, uh, for your show. Thank you, Christine. Do you have uh, information regarding candida and dementia? Oh, there was a, oh, my gosh. Um, uh, well, yeah, okay. So if I were you, Christine, and this question was eating at me, it was really, you know, this is a big deal. Um, I would pick up, Dr. Uh, let me show it to you. Oh, John, I'm sorry, I didn't put on that graphic we made. This is a book called Atherosclerosis, Hope at Last. Big, thick book, 700 pages. The whole book is on yeast and fungus leading to heart disease, okay? That's just heart disease. The, Dr. Uh, Crook, Here's another book I want to show you because this one will open your eyes. Dr. Crook wrote in the Journal of the American Medical Association, Bill Crook, the author of The Yeast Connection. He told me years ago that he had written about depression. Now, dementia, that's something you've got to figure out. Here's the missing diagnosis. That's Dr. Orion Truss. What a neat guy he was. He says, they say you're neurotic, but do you experience depression? Anxiety, irrational irritability, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, heartburn, indigestion, loss of self-confidence, inability to cope, lethargy, symptoms of contact with food, chemicals, migraine, headaches, disorder, all sorts of female problems, then you could have a candida problem. Even, uh, even the doctor I interviewed on TV, Dr. Simoncini, who said cancer is candida, I don't agree with that. Candida is one of the pathogenic fungi that can induce cancer. Uh, but um, I think there are many, many others. So once again, here's the great thing, Christine, with my work. Go on my diet for a month. Have whoever this is go on my diet for a month. There are books written about depression and diet. What those books don't know is the word candida, yeast, Aspergillus, you know, Fusarium, the things we talk about here on the show. You're going to, I lectured on this. Um, John, do you remember the name of that seminar I gave at ACIM? It had a great name. Something about the brain. 
I can't remember that. Yeah, I don't either. But they had a great name for it. And I got up and I spoke in front of one of the leaders in alternative medicine. Huge name. He's from Germany. Dietrich Klinghardt. Um, and Dietrich Klinghardt told one of the cardiologists that I won. I had the lecture there. Dr. Klinghardt believes everything a retrovirus, most things are retroviruses coming back to haunt us. I believe most things are dormant fungi that come on as we age to haunt us. Anybody, fill in Chris, Christina's blank. This is such a good question. Christine's blank. Do you have information regarding candida, she says, and dementia? Now, what I want you guys to do is close your eyes. Doug, do you have information on migraines, stomach problems, yeast problems, skin problems, and any fungal organism? You can be the boss. You can figure that out with the diet. Brain regeneration. Brain regeneration. Yeah, brain regeneration. Once it goes south, does it come back? I asked John to put up uh, a picture of something that I took this morning, or this afternoon. Uh, we had, you remember that, all that food I had sitting on my desk a week or two ago? It was real food. John bought it uh, for us to show on the air. Well, as we were pitching it out, I mean, we're a bunch of guys that work here. And the guys don't throw food away. They let it sit on the counter forever. Look at the picture of the lemon. Eventually, folks, we're all headed down this road. You got it at Whole Foods? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, good product, organic lemon. The organics go quicker without chemicals to keep them from deteriorating. But that oil in that lemon skin is called D-limonene. It's a terpene, a, a monoterpene. But it's called D-limonene. And that is very, very potently antifungal. And it took a bunch of guys 14 days of letting it sit there to become that infested with fungus. Eventually, I'm sorry to admit you guys, I'm sorry to admit this, eventually we're all going down that road. And it seems as the older and the poorer health and the more overweight we are, that happens more quickly. And that's what I'm trying to teach you here. If you raised your hand and made a pledge you were going to lose weight, good time to do it. Yes, so that's a good point. John's point is really well taken. If you notice, John, I picked up just the other day at a health food store out in Austin, bear, uh, uh, blueberries. It's like $8. There's got to be 18 of those things in there. I couldn't believe it. But they're organic. And you pop it in the refrigerator, and today, for breakfast, I open up the refrigerator, and they're already starting to deteriorate. So John's point is, if your food is deteriorating very, very rapidly, um, that's organic food. Eat it. Don't buy too much. Eat it quickly. Right? There's no spray on there to preserve it. No chemical spray on there to preserve it. Okay. Uh, Janet, uh, thank you so much, you guys, for all these great questions. Would love to hear your input about the dog worm or fenbendazole that people are taking for cancer. It's all over YouTube. Janet, I've, oh, this is so much fun. This, uh, if you get a chance, John, this is uh, Dr. Yu's book. It's called Accidental Cure. <laughs> On the back of this, Simon Yu is a, a medical doctor in St. Louis who called me a few years ago and he said, I'm fascinated with your whole fungal hypotheses. Would you come lecture to all these doctors? So I flew out to St. Louis and lectured for him and we became friends. Warning on the back, your medical problems may not be what you think, what you have been told, or what has even been diagnosed. So get this, you guys. This is the story. This is the story of a doctor who was in the army. He was a full colonel. He, was, he said, some guys gave blood. I went to, you know, into the military and worked as a colonel. And as a colonel and a doctor who knew a lot, they would send him to other countries. And he'd open clinics. You know, he'd help the people uh, indigenous to that area. He'd help them with their health problems. And a couple of countries, he said uh, on, on my show, 
would, he'd hand out, you know, fenbendazole and dewormers to all these people coming up. They weren't sick. Oh, some of them had scratches. He'd look at it. But month after month, he, all he'd do, he was duty bound to hand them a pill, a dewormer pill. And he said a couple of years into that, he began to realize these people never came to see him with cardiovascular breakdown. They never saw him for, you know, suicidal depression or cancer. They just stood in line, thousands of them, and they'd all take this pill. And there's a couple of dewormers that he talks about. And he said, I went back to the U.S. His whole practice is that now. He's in love with fenbendazole, so it's no wonder. It's no wonder when I started screaming from, you know, the mountaintops that black walnut and many other herbs have anti-worm, oh, by the way, anti-parasitic, fungi parasitize man. That which kills worms kills parasites. No wonder these people were all so healthy. Imagine if our government opened shop and we had to stand there, you know, for an hour in line to get our Sporanox. I don't think we'd see anywhere near. Shh. We don't want to see that in the U.S. We're a symptom-bound nation. Shh. We treat symptoms. I have ringing in my ear. Take this. Not, are you a swimmer? You know, I mean, it's so fascinating. I love America. I held a gun in my hand in a war, and I'd have used it for this country. I love America, but medically speaking, I know which side the bread is buttered on. We're here to sell drugs. If I were a doctor, uh, you don't want to go down that road. So, uh, Janet, fenbendazole, but now what are we finding? What did I talk about today? This guy, Curtis Chong, MD, PhD, repurposing drugs isn't new. We've done it with ketoconazole for fungal infections in the past, and we're now using it to treat prostate cancer. What about, uh, uh, what about uh, Spornox, itraconazole? It's now a cancer drug. So what, what this doctor, and we're good friends, what Dr. Yu figured out a long time ago was when you give people something to kill worms in their body, oh, by the by, and to kill fungus, they don't get sick. We don't have to take fenbendazole unless we haven't followed the rules to staying well. To, to live well is to live actively an antifungal life, sweating, exercise, everything that's good. You read about broccoli and kale and, and chlorophyll. It's antifungal, antifungal, antifungal. Okay? Vitamin C, antifungal. B vitamins, folic acid. Well, Doug, if we don't... You know, if we don't put folic acid, we don't give women a double dose of folic acid, they might be born with a child with a, with a disability. Yeah. What's folic acid? Oh, it's an antifungal. I mean, I lived this personally with one of my tremendous, the nurses that worked here. Uh, she had a child with spina bifida. And she told her story in one of my books. All she could eat during her pregnancy, couldn't get enough of it was corn, had a child with spina bifida. So sometimes we serendipitously make some of these discoveries. Um, I'm, I'm a total, if I had cancer, fenbendazole, remember what that ends with? Fenbendazole, A-Z-O-L-E. Didn't you tell us ketocone azole was an azole? Prostate disease? Yeah. Didn't you tell us itraconazole? Is Sporanox for cancer, breast cancer, it's it? Yeah. A-Z-O-L-E, the cat's out of the bag. Fenbendazole, A-Z-O-L-E, kills fungus. Of course I'm for it. Thank you, guys. Okay, this is good, Melissa, thank you. Is it possible to take an antifungal drug with oral chemo for grade two uh, to three brain tumor? I'm, I'm thinking of it chemically. You guys need to know something. Um, one of, this just blew me away, and if you're a regular, if you're a regular watcher, if you've just dropped in, your mouth's going to drop open. 5-FU, 5-fluorouracil, is a uh, breast cancer, and it's used for other cancers. It's a breast cancer chemotherapy drug. I've, I've always thought, this is a medical textbook, I've always thought that um, 
anything that would help a cancer patient's got to kill fungus. Chapter 2. So let me find chapter 12. Okay, good. Here it is. Okay. Listen. To, oh, thank you, John. Go with me. Flu, flucytosine. Flucytosine. Chapter 11 in the book, Antifungal Therapy, by my dear buddy, Dr. Ganum and Dr. Perfect. Chapter 11 opens. Originally developed as a treatment for leukemia. Uh, flucytosine, ofluorocytosine, 5-FC, is an antifungal drug re uh, with restricted use in present-day therapy. Use a monitor significant as a, okay, and is uh, restricted for systemic use in modern-day therapy uh, to the use in selected cases of candida, uh, et cetera. In contrast, amphotericin B has been proven to improve treatment outcomes in patients with cryptococcal meningitis. And it goes on and on to tell that some of these drugs used in cancer therapies are antifungal drugs. I have thought for years of my life, I, look, I have friends who have not only survived chemotherapy, but today they're doing great. They thrive. And I've always wondered what it was in these chemotherapy drugs that might have helped them. Because you and I hear all the time, well, they're poisoned. They're, they're killing people left and right. The whole goal, I'll, I'll never forget, Kyle Drew, my dear friend, was a oncology a sales rep for the biggest pharmaceutical company when he graduated from college. And he told me one day he's sitting with a bunch of these drug sales reps and their professor came in and he said, now the very definition of chemotherapy is that which kills the disease before it kills the patient. And Kyle sat in his chair and he started laughing. <laughs> that's great. He looks around, nobody else is laughing. And he said, boy, that's when I realized I'm in a serious business here. They have antifungal potential. Uh, is it possible to take an antifungal drug with another antifungal drug? I think yes. But rarely does a doctor know that uh, some of these drugs are antifungal. I might, Melissa, I might wait until I'm done with chemo. I might change my diet to starve if there is a fungal pathogen inducing the growth of the lump. I might uh, talk to the doctor about it. Uh, by the way, all you have to do, folks, is go on the internet. Uh, you know, Sporinox, or, or I think it's easier to go to itraconazole, I-T-R-A, itraconazole, and cancer. And man, you'll have all the papers pop up, how it's being used for various and sundry different kinds of cancer. And all it does, it was developed to kill toenail fungus. So, um, yeah, I, I think uh, together they'd be okay, but I'm not the doctor, so I ask the doctor and, uh, you know, let us, uh, let us help you if we can. Maria says, hello, Doug from London, UK. I'm learning a lot from you. Thank you so much. May the Lord continue to bless you and the team. I'm starting my nutrition therapy course for three years here in London. Wow, good for you, Maria. Stay in touch with us. I love to see these amazing people globally, which I get to do go into nutrition. These aren't registered dietitians. They're not going to tell patients in a hospital, you know, to eat whole grains or jello. These are people who really are hungry for, and I shouldn't, my aunt was a, a registered dietitian and just funny and clever and wonderful. Um, but I think we have to go beyond dietitians. We have to go to a better understanding of why which and why food works or not. My humble opinion, that which feeds organisms, living organisms, probably not okay if we have a living organism in our body, and I think many people do. Why would they take uh, an antifungal drug, Sporinox, test on 500 people, and 81% of them, they weren't on diets, 81% of these people 25 years ago had their cholesterol or triglycerides lower. Random, right? So you have to know which foods can stop feeding fungus and which foods, corn, wheat, peanuts, grains, barley, feed fungus, okay? 
Good for you. I'm really excited for you. Congratulations, and God bless you. Great to hear from you. Okay, so uh, Lynn says, my son works for a medical hospital and is made to get the flu shot. It's been a couple of months since he got it. He had to go to the doctor today. Uh, and just had to go to the doctor today. He's been told that he has the flu. <laughs> Thank you, Doug, for all you do. You know, that's insensitive for me to laugh. After 50 years, why his peers, Lynn, say that's impossible. You can't get the flu. The newest one that I had to chuckle at, I'm sorry, was well, the reason some people, you gotta, folks, when you don't know, you better dig up. If you're asking for mass immunization, you better dig up some thoughts really quickly. Sit down with a team of experts and dig up some thoughts. And the new thought was, why do so many people, many of the people I know, won't get a flu shot because they get the flu? Impossible, says the Center for Disease Control. So the newest reason that it can't possibly give us the flu, or why does it give us the flu? Number one, it's a dead virus. Doesn't vitamin C, it's dead when I swallow it, but it still amps up my immune system. You know, um, but number two, and I think they are quite serious about this, is it's coincidental. You get the flu during the flu season. You took the flu shot and the next day, the flu bug finally, and, and then the cute one I love. You know, you people don't know this because you're not bright uh, like we are. But it takes a couple of weeks for that flu shot to work. It's coming out of the woodworks. Here's the cool thing. I held a little 45 revolver, or little 45 gun in my holster <laughs> during the war in Vietnam, just praying I wouldn't have to use it, and I didn't. Uh, but it got rusted in my holster, and I ended up getting in trouble for that. I wasn't there to shoot. I was there to try and patch up people who were shot. Um, folks, you've got to... We're free in America. They're free in the UK. We're free to make that decision, but that door is quickly closing. I read a thing the other day that our Congress is owned by the pharmaceutical industry. Why not? If they own our doctors, what's next? Congress. Everybody's got to be on. Do you remember two, three years ago? Statin drugs are saving millions. Who's that statistician? You should have been dead. Your cholesterol is 201. You took this, it's now 180, and you're not dead. You, so you survive. Millions statin drugs are helping. Folks, my cholesterol's always been 225, 235, somewhere in there. Always been. I'm never taking a statin drug. But do you remember when they wanted to statify our water supply? Remember when they wanted to put in public utilities, water supply, statins? Because we were saving so many lives. Trust me. Be careful out there. Be careful. Do you feel like you're alone? I've done stories on TV. Kids were on our own. And even at 70, I feel like a kid. I really feel that we're on our own. Our doctor is biased, God bless him, and then he's honest. But I've got to tell you, he's in the back pocket of the pharmaceutical industry. Okay? Show me a doctor who hasn't written a prescription for three years. I'm going to show you a doctor who's in trouble with his license. Okay? If he's in medicine. So thank you, Lynn. I'm sorry your son has to go through that. I wish, I'd love to tell you guys these vaccines work. I just don't have enough insider information. I don't, I'm not comfortable with some of the ad, adjuvants that they put in it. Um, wow. Um, okay, so Mary, my buddy, howdy, Doug, howdy, Mary. Florida in the house. Oh, man. She's living a good life. Diflucan, Diflucan given to me for chronic bladder infection. Should I take it? Is it safe? Wow is my first expression. Your doctor gave you Diflucan? considering that not only the vaginal wall, but the bladder itself inside could be impregnated with yeast instead of bacteria. High five, Mary. You've got a doctor I wouldn't leave. When antibiotic after antibiotic after antibiotic, like I said in the woman's book, when antibiotic and antibiotic and antibiotic fail you, think fungus. Who said that? Doug said it for 48 years, and then the Center for Disease Control is now saying it. If those pills ain't working, Think fungus. 
and they're shouting to your doctor. So Mary's doctor said, okay, try one. Mary, I, I'm very bullish on an antifungal. I would be careful of grains in my diet or alcohol in my diet. And I'd take, you'll, many women, if it's 150 milligrams, many women feel relief of bladder infections that night, the night they take it. Okay, same with vaginal yeast, that night. So that's why they don't give you another one. They can pretty much wipe out the yeast if this is. Remember, to a doctor, an infection is bacteria. To your doctor, he's thinking the right way, okay? Oh, yeah, so conchetta, concita. My husband just had cataract surgery, made his floaters much worse. Anything he can do to stop them. Look, with glaucoma, sometimes with floaters, with uh, other eye problems, people have been telling me that can see Conchetta, C-A-N-C. Go online, look for it. It's drops that you put in your eye. There's a Dr. Bob Martin I heard on the radio when I was driving back from Austin one time talk about it, and I was totally convinced. Uh, his personal story and then the patients that he had put on this can see. Give it a try. And then eat the right foods, of course. What, uh, Judy, what is the acronym for... Oh, uh, it's uh, PCR. Polymerase Chain Reaction. PCR. Acronym for the... You can do um, microbe testing very quickly. You know my friend, Dr. Soraya? Um, he's currently... I'm hoping he's going to do this. He's thinking about developing a laboratory here in the Dallas area uh, using this, uh, this PCR testing. Thank you. Yeah, okay, good. Alice, blessings, Doug. Uh, kind of odd that there are several remedy supplements for animals, fungal joint issues and not for humans. The doctors say fungal arthritis is rare. When all you own is a hammer, then the whole world looks like a nail. When all you own is arthritis drugs, why would you treat with an antifungal, okay? Um, yeah, isn't that strange? Do you know, folks, I'm, let me, let me land this with carrying along what Alice is talking about here. Two years ago, we had a cat that was 90 years old who was dying, and we had a spry little kitty who was dying from thyroid disease. And one night at 3 o'clock, my wife woke up and said, I've, we've got to take her in. She's dying. And she was really sick. So we got up and went. We drove. It was cold. So it was a couple years ago now. We drove to this clinic 20 miles from our house, and... They had a veterinarian in there, and she saw this cat, Alex. Alex was really sick and thin, like seven pounds. Normally, they're 10 pounds. And the doctor said, yeah, she's got thyroid disease. She's going to die. And I had a doctor on my show, a holistic doctor, uh, years before, right here in Dallas. And uh, my wife said, okay, well, we have a cat doctor at home. Well, it isn't going to do any good. The cat's got... 90 days to live. Very nice veterinary, female veterinary. So first we took our veterinarian out here during the day, and he said, yeah, no luck, you guys. I'm sorry. And my poor wife's just torn apart. Um, he's, she's going to die, maybe four months. We asked, you know, we start her on this food, and pet food has, mycoto has what? Mycotoxins. You know, fun oh, no, no, food doesn't. Okay, there's another 100 bucks. Off we go. So I call in this holistic uh, veterinarian, very nice person. Um, he recommends doing IVs. She's got thyroid disease, she's gonna die, but maybe we can make her life more miserable, uh, more better before it becomes miserable, more better. Better before it becomes miserable. How much? Well, so far we've got $1,000 into this sick cat. Alex is nine pounds, eight ounces, spectacular. My wife said to me on the drive home, if this was one of the doctor's patients who came to see you, what would you, if the cat could talk, Alex, you may have fungal thyroiditis. All three laboratory tests came back, thyroid, cat's dead, 
they die soon. Very common problem for cats. Alex is now two years older and she is thriving. We feed her turkey, vegetables on occasion, chlorophyll in her water. This cat is thriving. I am so tempted to go back to those three doctors. You know what I'm saying? You guys are with me. I'm so tempted to go back and say, stop. Think fungus, you guys. Think fungus. I have enjoyed this. Tell your friends at 2.30 this Thursday, we're going to do 90 full minutes, an hour and a half, and we'll expound. I think there's some good questions here. Let's lead off with those and some other things I want to talk to you. God bless you. I've enjoyed it. Bye-bye.